Hello and welcome to another official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you from Vitality Stadium. We're here to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the Cherries, past and present. Now, for those of you who haven't tuned in before, my name's Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. As ever, I'm joined by my colleague and Cherries Encyclopedia, Neil Perrett, who has been covering the club for over 30 years. Neil, it's great to be back. Two podcasts in a month. How lucky are we? We're very, very lucky, Zoe. And uh, they use the word legend in football far too free and easily, but I'm delighted today that we can definitely say today's guest is an absolute club legend here. Absolutely. To have two podcasts in a month means we have to have a very special guest joining us. And this man is none other than a club legend, as you say, Neil. 144 goals in 223 games for AFC Bournemouth and the club's second highest goal scorer of all time. He was part of the side that secured the club's first ever Football League promotion 50 years ago. And of course, is famous for those nine goals against Margate in the FA Cup. Now, you've probably guessed exactly who we're talking about. So without further ado, it's an honour to introduce Ted McDougall onto the AFC Bournemouth podcast. When you were saying we're waiting for this legend to come, I was, I was waiting for somebody to come in. You know, <laughs> I, I thought, who are they talking about? So it's, it's great to be here. And uh, we brought some nice weather with us from Florida. So it's fantastic. <laughs> well, Ted, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. It's going to be a, a really great podcast. Now, before we start, it is a very busy day at Vitality Stadium today. So apologies if you hear the odd refrigeration unit or the odd uh, bump in the ceiling, but we'll do our best to deliver another interesting and insightful AFC Bournemouth podcast. Anyway, we are going to get straight into it. And of course, Ted, there is just one place to start. On the 20th of November, 1971, Slade were number one with Because I Love You. A pint would cost you 16 pence. And social media was when people actually spoke to each other. On that day, you also set an FA Cup individual goal-scoring record by netting nine times in an 11-0 win against Southern League side Margate. What are your memories of that day? I just remember the weather being raining and miserable. (laughs) And um, the fact that I didn't realise, nobody realised it was a record or anything like that. Um, I went up to London, we had the sports shops, and uh, they were looking for me in this um, hall. And I'm going, what's going on? And I, we went and had something to eat and went down Fleet Street for a paper. And I thought, see if there's a little bit in there. And it was, my goodness, it was all over the paper. So then I kind of realized that this seems like a big deal. How often do people talk to you about it? How often are you reminded of the day? Because, you know, it is... It is, a, it is a record, as you say, and it's such a famous day in, in AFC Bournemouth history. Well, living in the States, no, but um, I, I try to remember, uh, let them remember and, and, and make sure that they know. <laughs> and for you, it must be so nice coming back. When you come back to Bournemouth, does it, does it bring back those memories of, of you know, I mean, the club? I mean, I, I, I saw a lot of people the other night when I went to the game, and um, I think I'm banned now. Maybe I might not get back in, um, but certainly... Um, the same people and they're wonderful and it's, it's just it's just so so great to see them and and yeah, everybody's you know healthy and happy and good. Ted, the perfectionist that you are, you only got the nine goals that day and you said you should have got the eleven. What went wrong? Well, well, I remember the the goal that Mel got. I don't know what the heck, hell he was doing up there. I mean, it was a corner kick. I remember, and I was just going to head it in. And uh, he got in front of me and, and he scored. And I, I said, well, you're not supposed to be up here. And uh, and then Mickey, I can't remember Mickey Cave's goal, but, you know, I was disappointed I didn't get, didn't get the 11. <laughs> so, it, I know it's a long time ago. I'm not asking you to analyse all the nine goals. One was a penalty, I seem to remember. Can you remember anything about any of the, 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 the nine or the eight? Or- I remember, I think I got maybe a couple of diving headers, I think. Because I was better in the air than I ever was with my feet. <laughs> I had a lot more control in the air. And so, no, I, I, I actually don't remember a lot of the goals. There was a crowd of about 12,000 there for the visit of a Southern League team as well. Those were the crowds in those days, though. Yeah. It was um, astonishing what, how Bournemouth, you know, were attracting so much attention. And uh, it was just great to be part of it, you know, John Bond was getting everybody going and, uh, you know, he was bigger than life. And um, it was just the start of a a journey. 
it was a relatively routine cup tie regarding the early rounds of the FA Cup and there weren't very many press here and your feet went relatively unnoticed on that Saturday and Sunday and I think it was only when the national papers really got hold of it on mon on Monday that everybody realised what an amazing story it was. Well, there was a story behind that. Um, <clears throat> that when I got back from London, from what I was mentioning, with the sports shops thing, there was a, an event on. And uh, John John Bond got an, a, a call from Jeff Hurst. And Jeff Hurst had his testimonial going in, at West Ham on the Wednesday. And he had, he had a World eleven, a World eleven. And all the great players at that time were playing it, and he invited me to play in it. And um, that was the first time I encountered Tommy Doherty. So it was all downhill from that point on. But uh, it was, you know, they were, they were all, they, they were so, and it was unbelievable to, to be part of that. So when you say it was a World Eleven, Ted, I mean, I've seen that Eusebio was in it, who, who, and um, Jeff Hurst and Jimmy Greaves. Yeah, they, they were, everybody was there. There were a lot of kind of German internationals, a lot of kind of um, Portuguese uh, internationals, um, Jimmy Johnson, players that I just kind of just as a third division player, I'm, I'm like in awe in this dressing room looking at these guys and, and I scored. And of uh, course, he, he hooked me at half time, so which was un, unusual for Tom, really. But there you go. <laughs> were you nervous at all? I was excited. I was because I think what John Bond had done, he built, he built us up to be. We were very confident. We we felt part of it, even though we were third division players. You, you didn't feel that way. Would it be fair to say that you almost turned into an overnight celebrity? You know, you're out on this pitch with all these world class players, and you've just scored nine goals in the FA Cup. It doesn't get too much better, does it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we were starting to get headlines. Uh, and people were focusing on a lot of stuff that was going on in Bournemouth. And uh, if you never lived it, you, you, it's hard to explain from where we were to what it had become. The season before, uh, we played Oxford City. We were like a non-league. And we drew, I think, 1-1 or something like that at Oxford. And we got them back in the FA Cup here. And we ended up winning. And I got six that, that game. So it was kind of getting warmed up for bigger things, maybe. <laughs> so, Ted, immediately after the game, what what was happening on the pitch after the game? Was it everybody mobbing you, or, or what? Or, you know, just tell us. No, and we all rushed off to get our our, our 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 pint of beer because obviously that's what you did. Everybody walked off and just uh, got a quick rub down with a with a mandarin macassin or a <laughs> or a drink, <laughs> and everybody was kind of laughing about it because it was such an unusual kind of event, I guess. I think, I don't know what, I think it was like four goals in the first half and five in the second or vice versa, I can't quite remember. Um, but it was something unusual for, for sure. A couple of funny anecdotes that came out of the Margate changing room or, for, or from the Margate side of things was the goalkeeper that day was Chick Brody. Now, he was... <laughs> He was quoted as saying afterwards that he was probably the unluckiest goalkeeper in history. Now, some stories about a hand grenade, a Jack Russell, and a broken crossbar. Right. Can you expand on those? Yes. Well, he wrote an article that said he's the most unluckiest goalkeeper in, in, in the, in, that there's ever been. And he mentioned these things because he, he used to wear the, the hat, you know, the flat cap for the sun, and somebody had put a kind of toyed hand grenade in it. And then another time he's in the middle of the, the goals and, the, and he, the ball or something hit the crossbar. This is Brentford. And the crossbar <laughs> fell on his head. And the other one, which I remember, this Jack Russell run on the pitch. I think it was on a like, Friday night or something. It was on the television. And this Jack Russell was on the, on the pitch. And uh, he tried to stop it. And it flew at him and just accidentally hit him on the kneecap and kind of put him out for weeks. And then the fourth one was, you know, the the eleven nothing, and it, it did. He kind of made it a bit easier because he said Ted didn't get all them goals. You know, there were a couple of old, old G's, so it made him feel a bit better. And then, you know, but that that was his story. Yeah, yeah. Was he want to shake your hand at the end of the game or not? Yeah, well, no, they, we, they gave him the ball, but he dropped it. <laughs> 
so there's another story from the Margate manager that day, Les Rigg. Now, he tried to blame the referee for the result. He was saying that the referee, because of the weather, as you alluded to earlier, was so bad, he told Chick Brody to change his shorts after five minutes. <laughs> and this is what Rigg was quoted as saying. It affected the game because we were doing reasonably well up until that point, And then this lunatic made us do that. Do you, do you remember that bit? No. <laughs> Is he making this stuff up or whatever? I wasn't really that bothered about Margate, to be honest, because I was, I was more kind of in, involved with Bournemouth. I mean, at that time, we never really worked a lot of stuff on the other side of the, of the, of the, of the game. We, we, it was all about what we did and uh, trying to win and score goals. So, it's stood for 50 years, Ted. Is it ever going to be broken? I mean, I've been asked that question, obviously, a number of times, and I always believe that, you know, records are there to be broken. But I think as the game has developed and got more professional and so on and so forth, I think it, it's, it'd be very difficult for a player to get, you know, a team to get nine goals, never mind one player to get nine. I think that's going to be difficult. Oh, it's certainly a, a fantastic record. And from our perspective, we certainly hope it's not ever going to be broken. But we are going to take you right back to the very start of your AFC Bournemouth career. Freddie Cox signed you from York City for £10,000 in the summer of 1969. Was that money well spent? Well, not after we got relegated. It was like... <laughs> <laughs> it was, when I left Liverpool, I went to York for, for five and five and a half thousand pounds it was. And then I went there and we had to, I scored, I think, 40 goals in two seasons, but we had to apply for re-election to stay in the Football League the two years I was there. And then I get, well, I get into the third division with, with, with Bournemouth. And then and there were favourites to go up. And then we, I, ended up, I think I got 20-odd goals that season and, and we got relegated. I thought, this is great. You know, so I was like the, the kiss of death, you know, so my God, I, I, there's nobody going to be wanting me, you know. So, yeah, it was, a, it, that was disappointing, but it turned out, it changed my life. You know, you, got, you did, you got 21 goals that season. And despite the fact the club got relegated, that's still an amazing achievement, you know. In the first season to play for one club and you're scoring 21 goals, that's, that's some going. No, I mean, there was... There was lots of changes, and you know there was a lot of a lot of. Um, F Freddie Cox was a was a was a lovely man. You know, I, I liked Freddie Cox. He was he epitomised what I thought like Bournemouth because he, he he was sunburnt and he had the MGB GT and he had the mohair suits on and stuff. I thought he's great, you know, and uh, he had that swagger about him, and I, and I loved him. And uh, he because he had a news agency, agency, I think. And uh, he, he was just, a, I thought he was a nice man. <laughs> well, Freddie Cox parted company with the club and John Bond came in as manager next. Is it true he wanted to ship you out because he wasn't too sure about you? Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, he, you know, at that time he, he wanted me to be a right winger and to make diagonal runs. Well, with all due respect, I didn't know what a diagonal run was. I mean, it wasn't something that was coached, you know, in my lifetime. I can't imagine Bill Shankly saying, hey, son, get on your bike and get on a diagonal run. I mean, it didn't happen and I, I, I didn't know what it was. So I would, I said, look, I just want to get in the box and, and score goals. You know, that, that's, what I, that's what I do. That's all I do. And uh, he, 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 so I was kind of fighting him a little bit on it and... Um, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit mouthy anyway, I suppose. So at the end of the day, you know, he, we went... He, I remember the first game, we were at Newport or something. In Newport County. Anybody that's ever been there, it's not the greatest. He said, but close your eyes and think it's Wembley. I thought, crazy, if we close our eyes, we'll be three goals down. And uh, we end, then I started to make runs to the near post. And Tony Scott, bless him, we just passed a few weeks ago. Um, he would play this ball in to the near post and I would kind of flick it in and get in. And it, it, I got two or some, something like that. And I, I thought, wow, we're on our way here. You know, and I started to believe in it. Ted, you, we're going to try and focus on your time at AFC Bournemouth, but you mentioned Bill Shankly there. Now, 
you think that he invented psychology when it comes to footballers, don't you? Just give us an, an example of why you thought... He was, he was a character. I mean, I don't know if you're allowed to swear on this podcast, but I mean, you can't say things and just... It's got a little bit more depth with it. Don't swear, but please do the accent for us. So he, we used to change in the, in the, in the reserve team dressing room at, at, um, at Anfield and then get the bus to go to Millwood. And it was all about the fiver sides and stuff like that. And uh, we, every, every, about twice a season, we all played Everton, the A team, B team, C team, reserve team, obviously the first team. And his house overlooked Belfield, which was the Everton training facilities. And he would be in the big bath and he'd be sitting in there and uh, he'd be going, Jesus Christ, son. He said, I've just watched them training. They're near fit, son. They're near fit. Their arses are all, all their, their arses are, in their pants are all ripped. They can't play, son. They can't play. And we're going, oh, bring it on. This is like, psychology wasn't even a word, you know, and it was like, because we didn't realize he was giving us this psychology, you know, and it was like, and you know, the, the other story was that the, the five asides in the training, training at Melwood was everything. And they used to have all like Reuben Bennett and, and Joe Fagan and Bob Paisley and Bill would all play in one team with two or three younger players and the other team would, you know, would be some of the first team. And Chris Lawler, who was a very, very quiet person, never said anything. And this, this goal went in that they thought they scored. And he asked Chris, he said, Chris, was that a goal, son? And Chris said, eh, no, no, boss, it wasn't. He said, Jesus Christ, Chris, the first time you open your mouth, it's a f lie. <laughs> was... <laughs> <laughs> so, Bill Shankly ahead of his time. Was John Bond ahead of his time? Oh, very much so, but for different reasons. Shanks was psychology and walked around with a, a strut and people went, wow. And John was all about coaching and I'd never been involved with any coaching, all the, all the managers I'd had to that point. And when he started to do the, the angles and the movement and the kind of the third man runs and, and, and the, the movement you have to do, especially inside the box, I'll give you a story about with Chicharito, who, who, who did really well when he went to Manchester United. And he, if you notice, he, he scored a lot of goals at the beginning, primarily because he'd make one run, then he would come out of it and make another run. And then what happened, which was typical Manchester United, they wouldn't play the ball in when he made the run. So he stopped making the second and the third run. I'm not talking about long runs, maybe five yards, but little ang angles to lose the defender. And what happened at that point then is that he... He stopped making the runs and he stopped scoring the goals. And you see it every week at any level. Players today make one run in the box and they don't make another run. Aguero makes more than one run. If you see it, you'll see them make little runs. It's not, it's not big runs, it's inside the box. But you have, to, you have to move the defenders about. You have to get them on their, on their heels. You put the, mentally, you go into their shoes and think, what, what can I do to make him feel uncomfortable? What does he not want me to do? And uh, that's what he's trying to do. Now, around Christmas 1970, Bournemouth signed Phil Boyer. Now, apparently, it was on your recommendation. Just tell us about your partnership with him. Yeah, well, I mean, he, he came to York first uh, for about three, three and a half thousand pound. Um, Brian Clough um, sold him to York. And then, so he was with me at York. And then I recommended to John that, you know, you need to, 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 to sign this lad. And then he followed me everywhere I went, like four clubs. And, um, you know, and uh, we're, he's, uh, he, he, he did all the running and all the work and I took all the credit. So it was, it was perfect. You know, he, I just, just, Phil, get on your bike. You know, I said, okay then. <laughs> You're like the, the long, long distance runner. And I'm like, oh, you know, so it's good. Tell us, I know that when I was in, in the media, he was a very, very difficult man to, to, to get hold of. You see very little from him. Do you keep in touch with him at all? 
<laughs> no, he's he's like Howard Hughes. Um, I don't. I mean, he still lives in he lives in Nottingham, Bridgeford area, I believe. Um, and no, he's he, he's just a recluse. I, I think I told the story about when he had the when he had the budgie. And I was at the end of my career. I was going away in the summer, and I was basically kind of, I was, because uh, it took me forever to get fit. It'd be, it'd be October by the time preseason wore off, and I said, "Oh, I, I'm going to go away." So I went to America. I went to Canada another year. I went to South Africa another year. And he said, "Gee, I really would love to do that." He said, "I, I wish I could." I said, "Well, you didn't. Have, you don't have any family. You could go." He said, "I can't." I said, "The wife's got a budgie." And I'm like thinking he's taking, you know what? I'm got, what do you mean budgie? He said, well, he said, you won't leave the budgie. So a few weeks later, this is a true story. I mean, it's like it's a joke, but it's like, so he said, you'll never guess. He said, the budgie's dead. So I, mean, I felt sorry for the budgie, but I didn't, you know, I didn't make a big fuss of it. I said, well, now you can go anywhere. I wasn't being heartless. And, and then he said, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? He said, she went and bought another one. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> so I guess you needed that anchor. <laughs> so, 7071, ever present, 42 league goals, seven in the FA Cup. The Cherries were promoted for the first time in the club's history. Just give us your memories of that. I think the, the, the biggest thing that, that stands out for me is, is the amount of players that we had that went on to play in the the now Premier League, which was the first division, uh, with Norwich. I mean, half the Norwich team were all Bournemouth players. You know, David Jones, John Benson, Mel Machin, Tony Powell, you know, Phil, myself, and so on and so forth. They were absolutely locked. So we had momentum, and, and these lads were good players. I mean, they were knowledgeable. They were. I mean, we would go home, back on the coach, and we'd be getting the bottles out a bit like you saw with the West Ham Academy, you know, and, and we would move the move things around and systems and how you play and, and where people should be and how you get balls in, consistently talking about the game. And and it was always forward stuff. It never really worked on anything any defensive. I remember John saying to the players, Look, we've got we've got probably the best striker in the country. Let's get him in. So it was all about getting me in. I mean, I I didn't do, I didn't show, I didn't link the play, I didn't go down the channels, I, I didn't do anything. I just kind of, I was always making my way away from the ball, into the box. And then I, like I said, I was decent in the air, even though I'm, you know, I wasn't very tall, but I could I could jump, and I wasn't frightened it when the ball was in the air. That was my that was probably my my best. Best ability, I suppose. And um, I just asked about when we saw the pitch out there and wouldn't you like to have played on that? I said, not really, because I wouldn't have anything to blame. At least I could blame the pitch. I could say, well, I, my control's not good because the pitch is <laughs> But I didn't have to, I wouldn't have anything to, to blame. <laughs> so would it have been problems. Well, Ted, it was certainly paying off because when Margate came to town, the Cherries were five points clear at the top of the third division. And after the Margate route, you had 28 goals in the first 20 games in all competitions. Were any of those from outside the box? I shouldn't think so. <laughs> I shouldn't think so. I didn't go outside the box. <laughs> I, mean, I remember a defender saying, are you coming back for a corner? Why? I'm not... I, remember, I, remember doing, uh, I remember doing the uh, Hong Kong Sevens years and years ago when I'd finished. I was about 40 odd. And I loved it because you had the, you only had to get back to the certain line. You know, it was only a small pitch. And then when I went to America, and they had the thirty-yard line, and to open up the midfield, so you had these two thirty-yard lines. So outside the eighteen-yard box, you were thirty yards. I only had to run back to that. I loved it. It was great. I didn't have to, you know, fantastic. So I remember one guy at Norwich who went on to write books, and he said he went to a game when he was when he was with his dad, he was he 10 or 11. And he said, I fell in love with Ted, with what he said to my dad. So he, he then relayed this story saying that he, he said he, uh, 
he was walking back with his hands on his hips, McDougal, you know, and my dad from the halfway line shouted, get back and, and defend McDougal, you lazy, lazy b And Ted in his inimitable style turned around and said, f off. <laughs> and he said, I loved him since that day. <laughs> Well, you certainly were a fan's favourite and we can't talk about that 71-72 season without mentioning that classic diving header against Aston Villa in front of a then record third division crowd of 48,110. I think uh, a lot of AFC Bournemouth fans remember that one. We've had some fan questions coming on that one and, you know, it, it must have, you know, really stuck in their memory. What are your memories of that goal? Because it, it's shown on YouTube and different stuff, I've seen, I've seen that goal a lot and then that was a typical typical goal that was it was done on the training pitch and I'll, I'll explain it to you if you ever anybody ever watches it starts off with Tony Powell he comes across gives the ball to me and I knock it out to Tony Scott I span and and went into the box and what happened then is that Phil Boy which you don't really see on shot he takes the defender what you call underneath the ball so he takes him to the near post leaving the space behind the defender, which I then went away and came into the space that Phil Boyer created. And then Tony Scott, he wasn't looking to me, he was playing that ball into the space. And then I, I, I kind of felt that's where it was going to go. So that was a, that was a typical Bournemouth thing that we'd, we'd actually kind of worked on. Not that particular finishing, obviously, but that type of movement, because it was done because of a... Of, um, the other striker taking it, take, making the space for me. Well, despite another 47 goals that season, 71-72 ended in disappointment because we just missed out on, on a promotion there. There was a lot of speculation surrounding your future. What was that like for you? Hard. It was, I mean, we were getting lots of press at this point, as you can probably imagine. And I was getting a lot. And I, I went through a period where I just couldn't handle it. I just signed a five-year contract, I think. And I mean, I was on I was on good money. I think Premier League players at that time were on average sixty pound a week, and I was on one hundred and fifty pound a week. So I went to Manchester United for a ten pound a week rise, and uh, same amount of money that George Best was on, and Bobby Charlton, and Dennis Law. And they could only give me ten pound a week rise, and it's just that I I couldn't handle it. I, I remember after one particular game, we played about six or seven games. I think of the, the next season, and I ended up going into John's office, John Bond, and I, I just start crying and stuff. I said, I I can't handle this. I don't. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to leave. But I was. Um, mentally, you know, we were talking about it today. Would it have been, if, it, if it had been a psychological component to football at that time, I think it would have been ideal for me because it was, it was stressful and I, I really couldn't handle it. And I, and I went to Manchester and Manchester United were I think fourth off bottom or something like this. It, it wasn't a great thing. There were a lot of the players coming to the end and stuff and they, they weren't going to, when I make my runs, they weren't going to give me the ball because everybody wants to be the star because George had gone AWOL and, you know, and Bob, Bobby Chant was finishing and Dennis was finishing and they were in flux. Just keeping on the same theme, you went there for 220,000, which was a... No, no, no. 200. 200. You then, got the other 20, did you? No. I, we, I, had to go, I had to go as a star witness at Winchester High Court for Manchester United to take Manchester United to court, Bournemouth did, because there was a there was a clause in the contract, unbeknown to me, that said he had to have sufficient time to score 20 goals or something. And I was gone within 16 games or something. And they fought the case saying that they and they had all these barristers and stuff, and I'm in the I'm in the court with these barristers. And now I'm I'm the, the witness now. And it's kind of a little bit kind of, you know daunting and they have this picture of my house in in um, Manchester with a big for sale sign up outside and their whole case was on 
Well, there you go, Your Honor. He was obviously going to leave because he had the for sale sign. <laughs> and I, I started laughing. I said, actually, I wasn't in the house long enough to take the sign down. <laughs> so Bournemouth won and got the 220,000. Was it a bittersweet moment for you leaving here? Obviously, then you didn't know how it was going to go at Manchester United, but on the day or the week that you building up to you leaving? Exciting. In Manchester United are Manchester United. Manchester United are like, you know, if you're, in, if you're in a play and you're in the provinces, you're in Birmingham or Nottingham or something, and then the, you suddenly get this play suddenly goes to the West End. That's what Manchester United is like. It's like, I mean, obviously it's 10 times, 100 times more now, but even then it was like, I mean, I mean, George, George Best was, who I, I loved, and George, George kind of chained next to me the whole six months I was there when he was there because he was going down to London and he was going AWOL and stuff, and he's probably the, the best player I ever played with. He, I mean, there wasn't anything that George couldn't do. I mean, he could run, he could dribble, he, could, he was brave, he could tackle, he could head a ball, he could score goals. He was, he was phenomenal. Bournemouth fans were absolutely distraught when you left, Ted. Tell us about your relationship with Harold Walker, who was the chairman at the time. I think he fought tooth and nail to keep you. Harold, well, Mr. Walker, um, I, I, another person I loved. He was, he was a quintessential English gentleman. And I just thought, I just, I just had so much time for him because he was a gentleman. And uh, he was, he was a nice person. Did you have any dialogue with him after the move? Not really. I mean, you know, the, you know, everything moves on, and then the, the money they got, they got, you know, some players in. And uh, but I always followed Bournemouth, and you know, to this day, you know, and uh, that's why when Eddie was here, I, I, I blamed Eddie. I said, "You've made." From a, a supporter, you may be into a fan, Eddie, so thanks very much. I can't even watch the games. I'm a bag of nerves, you know, so, I, so I've become a fan. I just want to ask you about your shops because um, as a kid, I patronised your shops, but it was more than just sports shops, wasn't it? What, what, you had a little sort of arcade going, if you like. Arcade? Well, what, what you were in the wrong shop. <laughs> what were you, what, what sports were you buying? Di sports Direct, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, we we had like um, with um, we had about four or five sports shops, and then we had a cut price drugstore. Um, you can't say that; it's like as if you're selling drugs. No, it was just pharmacy and uh, and toothpaste and stuff like that. And then uh, a toy shop and stuff, and um, and then um, you know it, it became a little bit more difficult when I I went away, and um, especially when I went to Norwich because it was. You know, Norwich is fantastic, but it's a long way from anywhere. After playing for Manchester United, you did have spells with West Ham, Southampton and Norwich, as you said there. There's one burning question from your time at Norwich. In the 75-76 season, you won the Golden Boot. Now, for our younger listeners, players like Harry Kane, Cristiano, Ronaldo have since won that Golden Boot. Where do you keep it? I've never seen it. You've never seen it? No, I've never seen it. So you never got given I a golden boot? I think somebody melted it down and made it into something, <laughs> like a ring or something. So just for the record, you've won this golden boot on paper, but you never received anything for it? I never it. received it, no. No, never. I, I remember somebody saying, you know, you won the gold. I said, where the hell is it then? I never got it. Wow, well, we'd like to think that at some point, someone might pick up on that and might reward you with that golden boot. Yeah, right, like throwing that at me or something. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, moving on, six years after departing from AFC Bournemouth, you returned. It was November 1978. Tell us about how that move came about. Um, I was at Southampton. I had two, two, just over two years at Southampton. It was probably the, the funniest two years I had. They like, and I, I mean, that in the dressing room was fantastic. We had Shannon, Osgood, Bawley, I mean, Jim Steele. I mean, all sorts of characters. And Laurie, big Laurie McMenemy, handled them, everybody, with his inimitable style. And he was fantastic. And he had all, you know, he just kept, kept everybody smiling. He was he more, more of a manager than he was ever 
a coach. It's funny how managers want to be coaches and coaches want to be managers, but it's just what you are. And he was phenomenal. But I found that, I don't think it was, I think it was another mental thing where I thought I was a yard slower than what I, I was. We're playing in the, in the first division then. I just felt, but I think it was a mental thing. And I said, I think I'm done. And the lawyer said, well, he said, I said, I don't want you to go. And then uh, I said, I think, I think, well, so John Benson was the manager. And so I came back here thinking I'm going to be with, you know, somebody who understands my game and, you know, maybe, and, and like I'm coming back home. For you, how excited were you to come back home? Because obviously you've just spoken about how difficult it was to leave. So to be t returning to a place where, you know, you've, had such a successful time in your career it must have been really exciting um I, I wouldn't say exciting was the word i would say it was um because we weren't the same and you know they, they say don't they that you sh maybe you should never go back and i don't think i should have gone back um because i'm imagining what it was in my mind but it was nowhere near what it like that the whole club was not like that. Ted John Benson, as you said, signed you, but he was quickly replaced by Alex Stock. Now, um, what was Alex Stock like to work under? <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm. I'm sorry. The, um, another nice man. At my age, then after I'd gone through all this stuff, like I didn't need this. I didn't need this. I mean. I mean, I remember his first talk, something where he said, it was like, right, chaps. He said, we're Bournemouth, and we're going to get jolly well stuck in. And we're going to go jolly well up this league. And I'm going, no, no. And I, and he'd done well, you know, Fulham and different, he had, you know, he had, I think he had uh, Marshy there, didn't he? And he had, um, I think he had um, uh, George, George Best was there and everything. And Bobby Moore, and uh, he, no, no, it was all, it was all that was not good. I think Benji, the, that's here, he tells a story about we were they were waiting, for, they were doing a team talk in the morning. I don't remember this. He said, I think he's making this up to be honest. And he says, we were waiting for me. I wasn't in the, it wasn't in the change room. He's giving a team talk, and he said, in walks Ted, and he's got a gas mask on, a full gas mask on. I don't, I, I don't remember that, <laughs> but that's maybe what I was like, you know, I think it was very difficult to handle. That's got to be one of the shortest stories Brian Benjafield has ever told, Ted. <laughs> well, it, it kind of like, you know, it, it gets a bit longer as, as, you know, as I keep meeting him. Can you put your finger on why things didn't work out for you in the second spell? Players. Um, I, I, I... I didn't have the ability to beat people, run at people, so on and so forth. My, my ability was making runs. And if you don't see it, I might, as well sit, I might as well sit in the stand because I'll make the runs. And if you don't see it, and usually, it's wrong to say, but poorer players don't see, see the runs. They're just wanting to get the ball and, and do the right thing with the ball and, and pass the ball so they don't give it away. They're not looking to go, boom, play the ball in. And so they're not, they don't see my runs. And it was very, very, it was very, very difficult. And um, it wasn't a good thing. It wasn't, in any shape or form, it wasn't a great thing. It wasn't good for the club. It wasn't good for me. It wasn't good. For, it was disappointing. And then just tell us about how it ended in that second spell. Well, I went to um, Alan Ball this time. who was a dear friend of mine. Got the job at Blackpool as the manager, and he was still finishing off his his contract in uh, Seattle. So he he was committed to go up there, and and he he made me first team coach. So I've gone from here to first team coach, and I remember they had two or three very experienced players, and one of them was Peter Noble, and Peter Noble played for Burnley. He was a kind of bully headed lad and, and he was um he was they were all good pros, been around a long time. So 
I remember my, one of my first sessions and we were having a little keep ball and stuff and I, I gave a wrong decision inadvertently and he, he kicked the ball away. Now everybody's watching this, me with this, and there's no Alan Ball, I'm, I'm, in, I'm taking this session. And, and he, he said, Jordy, he said, yeah, you're legal, and you're this and you're legal. And he was going on and on and on. And everybody called him Nobby, Peter Noble. And I said, Peter. Peter. And it gave me enough time to kind of just regroup my thoughts and you know, what I was going to say. So eventually he stopped, and I, because there was no dialogue between the two. So I said, Peter, you're under pressure. I'm under pressure. We're all under pressure. Now go and get the ball. <laughs> and he did. And they were fantastic. They were really good. And we managed to stay up that year. And then um, so things happened in my private life. And then, then that was it. I just, just quit everything. Well, Ted, it was a, a very decorated career, but in terms of AFC Bournemouth, your incredible association with the club was marked in 2013 when a stand here at Vitality Stadium was named after you. How did that make you feel? Well, I remember, I think Neil Fetcher phoned me and he said, well, we were, I think they were playing Real Madrid and Ronaldo was playing because uh, I came to the game and they said, oh, they want you to, they want you to um, open the stand. I said, what stand? He said, well, they've got, a, they got a stand named after you. And they want you to open it. Right. Very proud, you know, like, wow, this is, you know, because Fletcher tells me all the time that his stand is bigger than mine. So, you know, so it's okay. <laughs> and I don't think the stand had any toilets at one time, you know, I think they call it Ted Shed, you know, and uh, it was, it was, um, and then I came and I, it was like, wow, this is, it's wonderful, and it was it was a it was a it was just great. I felt very very proud. It must have been a, a very proud moment. Speaking of the here and now, we believe you have links with Gary O'Neill from your time as Portsmouth reserve team manager, Christie, who's from Inverness, just like yourself. Yeah, well, um, Ryan Christie, I, yeah, Ryan Christie, I, I, I want to kind of meet um, um, because I, I found out that he was from Inverness and stuff, and there's not been many players that have kind of come through from Inverness. And uh, even though my my dad's team, my team was Inverness Clach and Cudden, they and they're still in the Highland League. And of course, his I think his dad is a coach at Inverness Cali Thistle, which was always the bigger club anyway. We didn't like to admit that. And um, so he, I want to speak to him about that and, and you know where, where he was brought up and stuff. And then. And Gary, I just I just seen the first time since um, since he was sixteen, and um, it was a game. It was a reserve team game, um, Tottenham area or somewhere. But we were playing Portsmouth. were playing Southampton, so you can imagine even the reserves. It was a kicking match and this, that, and the other. And, I, and Gary was sixteen. He was on. He was one of the subs. We didn't have many. I think we only had one, one or two subs. I can't remember. And I got him on with minutes to go. And so I just said to him, I said, I think you owe me some money. I said, because you, you had a hell of a career with it. I said, I never got paid for that. So, so I'm waiting to see if it'll, it'll be a check in the mail maybe. You can, uh, you can earn yourself that you were the one that gave Gary and uh... <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say so, but there you go, yeah. <laughs> His first chance at senior football. Anyway, moving on, speaking of yourself, just tell us a little bit about you know, where you're living now, whether you're still involved in football, what, what you're up to these days. Well, we've caught, I was coaching for a while um Bobby Howe was was one of the big coaches in 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 Chicago and he said you need to do a coaching license and I did the coaching badges the B license then I did the A license then and then I met a, a character called Gavin Owen Thomas um who who probably got the biggest well has got the biggest company for soccer in in the country uh, called Got Sport and Got Soccer and uh Gavin Owen Thomas, I said, good job your name, you know, wasn't God, you know, like Davies, it was <laughs> Gavin Owen Davies, you know. So he's he's become a very dear friend and he's really helped me. I've been doing it for nine years. And people say, like, Neil, Neil said, what, what do you do? I said, well, I don't know. I don't know what I do. But I don't know, you know, I just walk around and 
stuff. And because uh, everybody else is like IT literate and they're all great, these kids. And I'm the only person that works with a pen and a piece of paper and, and, and the pigeon gets in the way, you know. So but, uh, I enjoy it. We, I mean, it's a big company and we've got brand new offices and it's exciting time. We've now called Got Sport. And so we're the, the biggest in the country. Um, hundreds of thousands of kids are registered through our system and do a lot of the analytics. We run about 50, 60 countries. So we do the, the French National League with PSG. We do all the fixture scheduling for all the, 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 the soccer in, in, um, in the Premier League in, in Scotland. We do the MLS, CONCACAF, uh, South America, Brazil. Uh, do all their leagues. Um, the Chinese Basketball League, the, the, the cricket in Australia. So we do all the analytics and stuff. We've got kind of loads of people who work all over the world, uh, not just out of, out of Florida. And we've got four mathematicians, master mathematicians. I don't, I don't know what the difference is between a mathematician and a master mathematician. So like, so like, wow, that sounds good. And uh, so I just hear about those things, you know, from Gavin and stuff. But, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's been great. It's probably next to football is probably the best thing that has ever come into my life. It's been brilliant. Still involved indirectly with football and enjoy it. Ted, <clears throat> it's unfortunate people can't see you because you look as fit now as you did when you were playing. So you're obviously looking after yourself off the pitch as well. So apart from your work, your, your sort of home life, just tell as much as you want to, if you like. They, I, you know, I, I, I never did a lot of running and, and work when I was playing, but now I believe in it a lot. And I, I just, I think as you get older, you can't stop. And um, I, I just believe in, you know, that you have to kind of work, you have to kind of, do so every day I either run, I run, I do inter, in, what they call interval running. And then on the other days I'll do a bike ride. Other days I'll do weights, kind of lighter weights and stuff. So every day, and I really enjoy it and, and stretching and stuff. And, you know, my weight now is about one, probably about 160, 66, 167. Well, I played at 173, 174. And then, um, you know, I, you know, things happened a year ago and uh, I was diagnosed with, you know, uh, like a cancer. And I, I went in and got, got rid of that. And uh, I'm, I'm good, I'm clean and everything's good. I, I go every three months to get checked. Um, and um, I just have to put the weight back up and, uh, and build up my strength and uh but uh, i'm really kind of very happy and you know that i've got a great great wife and you know i love what i do uh, i live near the beach i live in florida it's not the worst and um as i said i don't want anybody to kind of feel sorry or anything but i mean I've, i have a great life and i'm i'm very positive i just believe you know i, I just believe in positivity and anybody that's negative, you might as well stay away from me because I don't want you anywhere near me. You just suck the life out of me and I don't need my life being sucked out with negativity. That news about your cancer, Ted, comes on the back of David Brooks here, obviously being diagnosed with, with, a, with a cancer as well. So if I could ask you sort of a message to him if he listens. Absolutely. I, you know, the first two months... You read, you hear about that. I have to tell you the story when it was, when it was di diagnosed. It was so that I went for my annual checkup and I had a kind of lump on my, it was um, tonsil cancer. And it was all around the tonsil and it was like a bump, but it wasn't hard or anything. It was just soft and squidgy. And then I went to get my annual, he said, oh, you need to get that checked. So I went to the ear, throat and nose guy that he put me in and this guy, he had the, he was a doctor in the, in, in the Navy for 30 years, so you can imagine what his bedside manner was like. It was like, like that of a slug, you know, it's like. So he goes and he feels it and he puts the camera down. He says, yeah, you've got cancer. 
And I'm like, well, I'm dead. <laughs> you know, because that's, that's the worst. That's, the, you know, it's the connotation with that. And it's not great. You know, it's like you, you just got this thing that, well, didn't see that coming. And, uh, and then he says, you're not going to die with this. I said, oh, okay, okay Sherlock. So he said, what I got to do? So he said, well, you got to have chemo, you got to have radi radiology. And then my wife gave me this uh, phone, the phone in the Mayo Clinic, which is like a five-star hotel. It's like unbelievable, unbelievable, like valet parking and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, they do what, uh, this, what's called a, it's a Da Vinci machine. And what it is, it's robotic surgery. And the guy's like six, eight yards away, feet away, looking in the screen. And they've got this orb going in my mouth with these fiber kind of tentacles that does the operation. And he's doing it from over there. And then, of course, I had the lymph nodes removed. That's why I've got this. I've got a lot of street credibility. I've got this scar. But it doesn't, you don't see it because of all the kind of creases I've got with the age. So, you know, you know, so they, um, he had, they took 22 lymph nodes out as well or something. And, um, and then I'm in the, I'm in this Mayo Clinic and it's like, it's like a five star hotel. It was $17,000 for one night. And then I'm up to $350,000, which Medicare, I'm, you know, I pay for the extra stuff and I'm mean, not costing me anything like that, but it's, and you know, for, for, for Brooksy to go through, it's, you know, you just, you have to kind of be, be positive, which I'm sure he is. He's going to be surrounded by great people. It's not, it's not like, you know, it's, yeah, in some cases, obviously it is. It's, um, it's not what you want to hear. But in most cases, it's it's manageable, and if it's treated early enough, and if it's if, if you've got great people doing it, which I'm, which you will, uh, you'll get over it. And the thing that he'll now he's having chemo. I never had chemo. I had radio radiology, which is they put you in the mask. They make a plastic mask, and you you're like Hannibal Lecter, you know, in, in Silence of the Lamb, you know, and and they screw you to this table. Like a gurney, and this this thing comes over you, and, and it, on my clavicle here on the side, they it kind of burn. It looks like a bad sunburn. It kind of hurt. And it, so I went for six weeks and uh, five days a week, seven seven or eight minutes it took, and then that kind of cleared up. So the only problem I had was, you know, I, I'm still kind of feeling feeling my my. Um, my neck and my saliva is not back to what it should be, and then I missed, and then I kind of missed the uh, the um, taste. I couldn't taste food or anything, which was really, really sad. And then my wife, she knows I hate Brussels sprouts. I hate Brussels sprouts, and so she makes this meal, and she sees, and I, she said, "How was the food?" I said, "Give me Brussels sprouts." She said, "How? How? how do you? I said, "I said, I said, I'm not blind." I said, it's my, it's my, it's my, it's my taste buds that have gone, not my bloody eyes. I can see the Brussels sprouts. She said, what they taste? I still, I said, it still tasted like <laughs> So, you know, it was, um, so I've gone through all that and now I'm up, I've got to go next month for my next one. And then I've got another year of that. And then I do two years of six months, six months, but it was, it was, it was clear and everything. So everything's good. Ted, I know that you're, you've taken in games when you're over here. Are the cherries going up this season? Well, being a fan, uh, I hope so. I, I, I think there are, I think the squad's as deep probably as, as it's been for a while. Um, I think, you know, you, you don't want to hear, and fans are, you know, when you get beat, but you, you know, you can't go through this league without having some sort of kind of things happen, bad things happen. But you find more in that than you ever do with success. And it's how players react. How do they interact? What's the next thing? I'm sure Scott will be looking now and say, okay, because he doesn't know, he hasn't seen this. How, how are they going to be? 
Will they, will they roll their sleeves and say, right, we're going to have some of this? Are they going to go, oh, no, the bubble's burst? I mean, you, you don't know that. He doesn't know. He's never seen these players in any adverse situations. Absolutely. Well, Ted, it's been brilliant chatting with you, but we always, as ever, end with a few questions from fans. They've submitted some questions on social media, so we've got a few quick-fire questions. First of all, Steve on Twitter You've touched on this earlier on, but with the higher quality playing surfaces around now, do you think you'd have scored more goals? Now, I know you said that the pitches before gave you an excuse for your touch, but how about now? Do you, if you were playing out there on the Vitality Stadium pitch, do you think you'd have scored more goals? I think the game would have, well, the game is different. Um, I think the three substitutes, five substitutes potentially will, will come in or may come in. It makes it into more of a, a game for coaches as opposed to just managers so they can change things and change the, you know, I don't know whether I would have liked to, you, you played for your shirt. You know, if you were the number eight or you were the number nine, that's your shirt and you wanted to play. I mean, you, Neil, you mentioned one season, it was like I played every game. Well, how many times is that going to happen? You know, and but I just find there's too many games and nothing to look forward to because there's a game every day. You know, and uh, I'm not talking about Bowman generally. But, uh, Another question that's been submitted from our German fan group. What was your first thought after the final whistle against Margate? It sounds like it was, get me to the pub for a beer. <laughs> well, no, that wasn't your first thought. I mean, the first thought was get to the dressing room for a beer. Um, but no, the, I, I didn't, I didn't. Apart from enjoying it, but obviously everybody did. I mean, I didn't really think it was such a big deal. As I mentioned, you know, I went to see if there was anything going to be in the newspaper at Fleet Street at 11 o'clock midnight to see if the papers were out, and it was everywhere. And, and then that's when I realised, heck, this is this is quite a big deal. One from Paul on Twitter. He's asking about your your shop in the Dolphin Centre. I think previously it was the Arndale Centre. Do you remember that one? Yeah, we had... We had we had no hardly any stock when we opened. It was a big shop, so we all had empty boxes, you know, like Adidas boxes or Puma boxes that were there was nothing in them, and um, and it was yeah, it was good. It was good being with the fans. I remember the one I had here in Boscombe. I'd go there before the game, so I, there's like few fans would come in there like, knowing that I'd maybe be in there, you know, and stuff. And uh, that was that was kind of neat because you were very close to the fans, you know, and you, John, invited you to go and have a beer with the fans. And I think that's what's, a lot of that is missing now for obvious reason with social media, and you can be in compromising positions with cameras and different stuff. So it's not, you know, it's not good. Ted, you've probably answered two thirds of this question already. Stephen Clark on Facebook is asking When you left Bournemouth in 72, you must have had a wide choice of clubs to go to. Why did you choose Man United and how did the move come about? We've answered the last two. So, did you have a wide choice of clubs to go to? I, if, if I did, I was never told that. Um, I, John, John Bond was very friendly with Franco Farrell. They were both you know, um, West Ham people. And then yeah, nobody's going to turn down Manchester United. Where, I mean, you know, where do you go after Manchester United, you know? So it was a massive big move for me. It was, you know, it was big and it was exciting. And, and then I, I, I managed to get a goal and we won one nothing on my debut and score, scored a header and stuff. and. That was like a dream, you know, it was great. And then I remember one game, you got, I've got to tell you this one, where we played Liverpool, it was match, match of the day, and I, I scored one and, and kind of made another one for Wynn Davies. And then the best of that was I had the best seat in the, in the, in the, in the, in the ground because I was on the pitch watching George Best play against Liverpool and, and just running rings around people. And I'm like in awe looking at this, God, this is great, you know. David Cordell on Facebook. One of the reasons you're here is for the 7071 reunion. Um, apart from that, Ted, do you keep in touch with any of the team from that era? No, no. I, I haven't seen some of these lads that I'll see tonight. I haven't seen them for 50 years. You know, it's, you know, players, it's, you know, like 
if you're playing amateur, you're playing with your friends or people in the pub and people that you liaise with and stuff. But when you're when you're a pro, you know, a manager brings you together. Some you get on with, some you don't get on with, uh, and and sometimes you kind of meet them directly, indirectly. When I come back to Bournemouth, I always talk to, you know, to see the same lads here, and which is nice. So I I, I kind of like that. Harry and Kevin Bond, Harry Redknapp, Kevin Bond. Yeah, well, Kevin I've known since he was twelve, thirteen, uh, and Harry. I mean, Harry I've known for donkey's years. And, um, you know, I love them both. And, um, you know, Kevin comes from good family. And uh, Harry is uh, Harry's just a great, a great character. And just an absolute wonderful, wonderful uh, character. And, uh, and he's good. I saw him the other night and uh, I think he's coming maybe tonight. Um, so he's, that's nice. You know, I, I, he doesn't change. Last question, Simon Ashley on Facebook. It's a int- good question here because we forgot to say that your classic diving header at Aston Villa was actually on match of the day. What was the press attention like after you scored that famous diving header? Was there still a lot of press attention then compared to what sort of press it would have got nowadays? Well, nothing like what you get today, for sure. Um, you'd get it from every angle and you'd get it from, you know, whatever. And... Um, it was it was just you know like we were saying there was forty eight thousand there I think it got broken just a few years ago with Sheffield United and Sheffield Wednesday it broke that record I think and uh, it was it, it was just intense and and it stopped the momentum a little bit when we got beat and then we got them down here I think there was twenty odd thousand here and we ended up beating beating them down here and stuff and uh, yeah it was uh, not getting promotion stopped the momentum. Well, Ted, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here on our AFC Bournemouth podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're so grateful to have had your time and, you know, to have you back over here at Vitality Stadium. Just one one thing to the fans. I mean, you know, this is a long season and don't get down. And I mean, hey, we'll be there at the end. And just you just keep believing and keep supporting and keep, you know, keep the faith because you will lose games. You've got no divine right to win games. There's another team that play in each game. So move on with it. Now then, if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we would absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it AFC Bournemouth related or the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Ted McDougall and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle, Thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast.